Okay, this problem involves uh, the application of the ideal gas law. So let's get our calculator ready. Um, we have an air bubble of volume 20 cubic centimeters at the bottom of a lake, which is 40 meters deep, where the temperature is 4 degrees Celsius. And then the bubble rises to the surface, which is at a different temperature, a higher temperature, 20 degrees C. Take the temperature of the bubble's air to be the same as that of the surrounding water. Just as the bubble reaches the surface, what's its volume? So the first thing about uh, ideal gas law problems is recognizing them, right? So how do we know this is going to be an ideal gas problem? Um, well, you know, not having the benefit of the source that this came from and the, the chapter that it's a part of, uh, we just kind of have to look at what's been given to us. So it looks like we have an initial volume, right, this 20 centimeters cubed, we'll call that V1. V1 is 20 centimeters cubed. And then we have, it's at the bottom of the lake, which is 40 meters deep, so not quite sure what we have to do with that yet, that depth. And we know the temperature at that initial state, T1 we'll call it, is 4 degrees Celsius and the bubbles rise to the surface which is at a temperature of 20 degrees C so we have this um, T2 now that we know let's actually we'll, we'll draw a picture after this just to get a sense of what's going on 20 degrees C and we know the temperature of the bubbles air is the same as the surrounding water so the air in the bubble is the same as the temperature of the surrounding water and these are the temperatures of the surrounding water so we can use these as our T1 and T2 and just as the bubble reaches the surface, what's its volume? So, we want to know V2. That is our question. Let's draw a picture. So we have a lake. This is my best rendition of a lake. Lakes are filled with water. There it is. And we have a bubble at the bottom, which is at T1 and V1, which we know and it reaches the top and it expands in volume well I guess I might have gave it away a little bit there what's its volume I'm uh, making the claim that it's going to expand rather than contract uh, we'll talk a little bit about the intuition about why that is um, and up top we know T2 but we don't so we know T2 but we don't know V2 that's what we're after Okay, and we also know this height, so what are they, you know, the question is what do they want us to use that for? We know that the height to the bottom of the lake is 40 meters. Well, another thing that's going on here that you kind of have to figure out from the picture is that there's an enormous amount of pressure on that bubble at the bottom. In fact, there's 40 meters of water column above it, which if you remember from the previous chapter on fluids about pressures, that generates quite a bit of, of force per unit area on that spherical bubble. So we should figure out what the pressure is at the bottom and compare that to the pressure at the top. The pressure at the top is pretty is pretty easy. We can assume that it's the same as atmospheric pressure at sea level. There's a column of air above the water level which is equal to the pressure of the atmosphere, right? So we could define a P2 up here as well and say that we know P2. P2 is one atmosphere. And I'll write that down here as well. P2 is one atmosphere. And we can convert that to other units if we need to. And P1 is going to be much greater than P2. It's one atmosphere plus 40 meters of water column. And if we remember the formula from fluids about pressure, the gauge pressure, I'll call it PG, in general equals rho GH, where rho is the density of the fluid. It could be a, a gas or it could be a vapor or a liquid. In this case, it's liquid water. G, the acceleration due to gravity, and H, the height of the column. And that's the gauge pressure. The absolute pressure, in general, is the absolute pressure is the gauge pressure plus 
well actually, sorry. The absolute pressure is the initial pressure, in general we maybe call it P0, plus that gauge pressure. So I know this seems like a lot of equations, but really what's going on here is the initial pressure at the top is P0, that's atmospheric pressure, that's P2 basically. Then tack on the additional water column that's below it, that's the gauge pressure, gauge meaning above and beyond the pressure of P2, you have this additional rho GH. So the pressure at the bottom of the lake, the absolute pressure, is atmospheric pressure plus a rho GH term for the water column. So let's actually calculate what that pressure is at the bottom of the lake, the absolute pressure at the bottom of the lake. I called it P absolute here because I was being general, but now I'm going to call it P1 because we define the bottom of the lake as state 1. It equals atmospheric pressure. Um, we could call it 1 atmosphere. Um, but we're probably going to, the units that this is going to give us is going to be Pascals. So let's be preemptive here. One at, I'll write it up here, the conversion factor. One atmosphere equals 101,325 Pascals. If you don't know that by memory, memorize it. That's the number of Pascals. Newton, Pascals is Newton per square meter. Newton per square meter and there are 101,325 of those in one atmosphere. So 101,325 pascals plus rho GH. The density of water, another thing to memorize is, I'll come down here because I'm not going to have space, 1,000, um, what's the units of density? Mass per volume, right? So it's um, kilograms per meter cubed times the acceleration due to gravity, 9.81 meters per second squared, times the height, which is 40 meters. And I'm running out of space again. So multiply all this together. You'll see the units will come out to be pascals. And you'll get a number, something on the order of. Actually, let's just get our calculator so we know we're being exact. We want to do, turn on, that helps, 101325. That is the um, initial pressure, P0. Then we're adding on to that rho GH. 1,000 is the density of water times 9.18, 9.81 rather, the acceleration due to gravity, times 40 meters, the height of the column. We get 4936. Four 493725 pascals and that is our P1. Okay. P1 493725. And while we're working in pascals, let's also change P2 to pascals. P2 is 101325, that's atmospheric pressure. Okay, and now we're ready to get into the actual ideal gas law part of this. So what is the ideal gas law? Ideal gas law says that, in general, PV, pressure times volume, equals NRT, where P is pressure, V is volume, T is temperature, N is the number of moles of the gas that we have, moles of an ideal gas, and R is the universal gas constant which is equal to 8.31 joules per Kelvin mole. And what is this issue of Kelvin? Whenever we're doing a thermodynamics problem, including the ideal gas law, we no longer work in Celsius and Fahrenheit. We're now going to work in Kelvin. The Kelvin degrees are the same size as Celsius degrees, but the scale is offset. So in order to get Kelvin temperatures from Celsius temperatures, we have to add 273 degrees. So 4 degrees Celsius is actually 277 Kelvins. And 20 degrees Celsius is 293 Kelvins. And that's really important because when we relate temperatures, we do it as a proportion or a ratio. And the ratio of 20 to 4 is much, much bigger than the ratio of 293 to 277. So it's really important we're using Kelvin when we do these formulations. Okay, so we know the volume, temperature, and pressure in state one. 
We know the temperature and pressure in state two, but not the volume. Now let's think about this air bubble as it's rising. It's trapped by water on all sides, and they want to know right before it reaches the surface. So in all cases, it's trapped by water on all sides. So the amount of moles of air that are in the bubble is not changing, and is a constant throughout this process as the bubble rises. R is defined as a constant. So N and R really aren't changing. So if we were to write PV equals NRT for state one, we could say PV over T equals NR for state one, right? Let's write that down. P1 V1 over T1 equals NR. And when it gets to the top, it's still the same number of moles and it's still the same universal gas constant. So the only thing that's changed is the pressure, temperature, and volume. So we could say that that constant now equals P2 V2 over T2. So these things have to change in concert. The pressure can go up, but the volume has to go down or the temperature has to go up. Because this quantity, P times V over T, has to equal a constant. So they can change, but the others have to change in harmony with them such that this PV over T term always equals a constant for this problem because N isn't changing and R is a constant. So we're going to relate P1 V1 over T1 to P2 V2 over T2. So let's go ahead and solve this thing for what we want, which is V2. So I'm just going to do a little algebra here, and you can check this on your own. V2 equals P1 over P2, P1 over P2, times T2 over T1. Notice how it's different because of T being in the denominator, so it changes. And then times V1. And since we have all these numbers, as long as we plug them in in the right units, we should be okay. So P1, 4,9,3,7,2,5 over 101,3,2,5. That's Pascal, so those units are the same. Um, the temperatures are, we put them in Kelvin, so we want the 293 over the 277. And then the initial volume is 20 centimeters cubed. I could change that to meters cubed, but if I don't, the only difference is I'll get V2 in meters cubed. So, you know, I, I'm perfectly happy to have the answer in cubic centimeters rather than cubic meters, because I'm probably going to change it back to cubic centimeters anyway. So I'm going to keep this one in the units that it's in 20 centimeters cubed, with the realization that we're going to get out an answer in centimeters cubed. You can change this to meters, it would be 0.02, and then your answer will be meters cubed, so no difference there. And let's plug this into the calculator and see what we get. We have 49, that's oh, still there, I can just use it, 101.325 times 293 divided by 277 times 20. And what do we get? 103, so just say 103 close enough, equals 103, and that's cubic centimeters. So, we discover that the volume of the bubble of air increased by a factor of about 5 as it rose up. Now let's think about the intuition behind that and why that actually happened. We had a pressure that was reduced by a factor of 5, right? And a temperature which was increased by 20, 20 kelvins, but 20 kelvins out of 277. So the temperature increase that it experienced wasn't substantial, but it was certainly there. So, so this is that temperature effect. By multiplying a number by 293 over 277, it increases it a little bit, but it, it's not huge but it was really the pressure. This thing was under enormous pressure at the bottom of the lake and then it rose and it got to be on top of that entire water column as opposed to at the bottom of it. Um, so that's what really made the difference and that's why you can actually see the magnitude of this numerator is five times that of the denominator. So that's why this number is getting multiplied by about five. And there it is, it comes out to be 103 cubic centimeters. An alternate method to do this problem 
would be to actually calculate n, the number of moles. So if you know P1, V1, and T1, and obviously the gas constant, you can just solve for n, find out exactly what the number of moles are, and do that as one separate problem without really even considering P2, V2, or T2. Then, in a very similar problem, using that value of n that you found, plug it into another PVNRT equation for state 2. You now know the moles, the pressure, the temperature, you always know the gas constant, you can find V2. So you can break the problem up into two steps. But it's nice to use these ratios and get it down to one formula if you can.